Good morning, ladies and gentlemen. My name is Alfred Kusenbauer. Some of you might know me. And I have the honor and the privilege today to volunteer for the Institute of Human Sciences. The Institute was founded in 1982 uh, by our friend, late Krzysztof Michalski, who passed away, sadly, some weeks ago. And the Institute developed into the most prestigious international social science institute located here in Vienna, hosted uh, many impressive scholars, postdocs, students, and contributed uh, significantly to the development of uh, freedom and democracy in Central and Eastern Europe. Uh, the Institute, uh, some years ago in 2005, decided to engage in a major conversation with our colleagues across the Atlantic. And therefore, since 2005, we are organizing seminars uh, around the topic of solidarity. And this year, for the eighth consecutive time, we organized this seminar on uh, solidarity in the premises of the Erste Bank. And uh, normally, this Burgtheater debate is uh, presided by these seminars. So the last two days, we were uh, discussing and arguing in a closed circle of around 25 academics. I think that the issue in front of us, inequality uh, and solidarity, is one of the most crucial issues of our times. We have uh, experienced enormous progress, what concerns the establishment of equal rights, equal rights between men and women, between uh, races, uh, liberal rights have been uh, on a success trip all around the world. And at the same time, we were facing enormous success in combating the extreme forms of inequality, which is poverty. And if you look to the success of Brazil or China or other places where hundreds of millions of people were led out of extreme forms of poverty, uh, this is on the success side. On the other hand, uh, we are facing unprecedented levels of inequality around the world, mainly uh, referring to the takeoff of the top 1% in most of the countries and around the globe. Of course, there are different types of inequalities. Some come from heritage, others are produced by markets, but there are also inequalities that are produced by political action. And uh, inequality is a multifaceted uh, issue uh, where uh, it's very important that we establish uh, some sort of uh, common analysis, what we are talking about. And when we were sitting together with our American colleagues, uh, many of them coming from Columbia University, a traditional partner of the Institute of Human Sciences, we also detected some differences. What is the priority prism of how to look at inequality? Of course, on both sides, the Atlantic, it's established to look to inequalities uh, between men and women. But for instance, we in Europe talk more about also about inequality between the regions. While in the United States, there is more talk about inequalities within the cities. And uh, so you have similarities, but also differences. And the unit of analysis when talking about inequality uh, seems to be a main reference point also when discussing about some of the solutions. We have um, some extraordinary colleagues today here on the stage. 
uh, Ira Katz Nelson to the left of me, uh, professor at uh, Columbia <coughs> University, uh, and uh, now president of the Social Science and Research Council of America, a highly prestigious academic institution. Ira just recently published his new book called Fear Itself, The New Deal and the Origins of Our Time, uh, a book that has been widely reviewed by The Economist, The New Yorker, The New York Times, uh, and within the next days will become the editor's choice. Uh, so for those of you who want to read it in English, it's already available. Uh, translation into uh, German will follow soon, I think. And Ira was uh, also working on uh, the theoretical concept. How can we understand inequality? What are the different layers of inequality? Uh, and he uh, will be happy to present uh, the theoretical framework for our debate. Please, Ira. Alfred, uh, thank you so much. Um, it's a great pleasure and honor to be here um, and to recall the many conversations um, led and organized by our dear friend uh, Christoph Mahalski at the Institute for Human Sciences. In, in thinking about uh, inequality, this very um, uh, rich and condensed word, um, it's sometimes useful uh, to think about it in more than one dimension or, or layer. There is First, the matter of the structure of inequality. What is the actual situation of, uh, uh, in terms of income and wealth, but not only income and wealth, also in terms of inequalities of uh, cultural assets, uh, inequalities of physical space, inequalities of access to the political system and to political influence. And at any given moment, in any particular place, there will be what might be called a, a structure of inequality that has developed over time between and among individuals, groups, uh, segments of society, um, in determinate circumstances. That's one layer, and that perhaps is the most familiar way in which we talk about inequality, the circumstances of relationship and difference uh, among those of us in uh, civil society. A second layer, not quite the same as the first, um, might be called the dimension of experience. We experience inequality, each of us, differently, uh, depending on where we stand within the given set of complex structures of inequality. And the word experience itself is, um, is not simple. Um, we experience reality in that we, we observe it, we take it in, but simultaneously we process reality, we gain experience uh, about that reality. We learn about inequality as we experience it. And that's a second layer and dimension. A third, also distinctive, um, is a level that might be called the layer of outlook or dispositions. The way in which we come to think about inequality, the way in which we might be disposed to act about um, inequality. Um, what kind of ideological worldviews do we have that um, we wear as lenses that help us see the world and interpret our experience. Because structure and experience on their own uh, do not uh, immediately or directly uh, lead to our own understanding of the world. And then last, there's a fourth layer, uh, the layer of action, what we do about uh, what we think. Um, and each of these layers of structure, experience, outlook and action um, has a degree of independent indeterminacy. That is to say, uh, people don't all experience the same reality the same way, 
And people who share experiences do not necessarily interpret those experiences about inequality the same way. And people who interpret inequality in a common way do not necessarily choose the same modes of action, uh, whether political or social or movement activities. So I'm hoping that in our discussion, we bear in mind um, each of these dimensions and especially think about the circumstances that connect these layers to each other. Uh, when is it that the, a given structure of inequality, whether in Austria or the United States or elsewhere, uh, generates particular experiences, how those experiences open up possibilities of different outlooks, and how various outlooks connect to or don't connect to various forms of activity as citizens uh, in our societies. Thank you, Thank you, Ira, for this theoretical framework for our debate. We immediately move to practice. Um, Elsa Fonero is um, Professor of Political Economy at the University of Turin, and she is a widely respected uh, academic in Europe, and presently is serving as the Italian Minister for Labor, Social Policies, and Equal Opportunities in the government of Mr. Monti. Elsa, how would you view the development of inequality. How do you address inequality, uh, bearing in mind the uh, problems that Italy and also Europe uh, are facing at present? And maybe you could link the question of inequality also with the debate that is currently going on in Europe. Thank you. There is here a group of juicy Italian migrants that would like to give our special welcome to the minister. And we are going to distribute a small flyer to tell who in reality is the minister and somehow to thank for the perfection of the title of this conference because she's in reality in practice as an expert of inequality policy. And it's a symbol of these inequality policies in Italy, and that's why most of us are looking for jobs to grow in this space. And in the last year, there has been an increase of 30% of Italian residents abroad. So we are now distributing a small flyer where we have a list of the most interesting elements of the inequality policies of the Minister for Grant for Now. And uh, we uh, wanted to share with you that. Thank you very much for this additional introduction. Uh, uh, and I think the Minister uh, now has the chance on basis of that additional introduction uh, to explain how she views uh, the development, the challenges, and the possible answers. Please, Elsa. Well, first of all, uh, thank you for inviting me. Uh, second, uh, I don't think I will answer, um, but uh, I would really like, uh, since I'll be here also in the afternoon, to meet uh, those Italian people that we're critical to my uh, uh, choices, to the choices that the government had to, uh, to do in a very difficult situation. I would very much like to have a conversation with you. Now I am asked here to give uh, my ideas and possibly something uh, which I may draw from my own experience, which has been very difficult. But uh, I beg you, I would like really <coughs> to meet you at the end of this uh, meeting, which is for a general audience uh, in, uh, in a foreign country. And uh, um, I really beg you to come early in the afternoon somewhere. We can arrange a meeting and I will be ready to discuss with you 
And uh, I have many arguments uh, to say that what uh, you call uh, the unjust uh, mm, political choices of the Monti government uh, are not uh, so much unjust, particularly since you are young. And there is certainly one dimension which is uh, very important in our choices, which is uh, the inequality among generations. And I have worked to reduce the inequality among generations because uh, public debt, the social security system that was uh, before our reform was heavily on the shoulders of the young generations. And uh, I am also ready to discuss the labor market reform that I had to enact. And uh, this labor market reform, which is done in a severe recession, in a severe recession, and so has not produced the results up to now, but it's again, it's for the young. It's for, um, let's say, making Italy a more attractive country for investors so that the young are not compelled to go abroad and maybe young people from Germany, from Austria, will uh, within a few years uh, come to Italy. But I would like, so I am inviting you, I'm here, I'm ready to discuss. I have a couple of hours and I can devote entirely to you. But uh, Thank I you, would Elsa. like... Thank uh, you, May I just say something on... on of course, uh, no, yeah. no, no, of course. <laughs> okay. Um, first of all, I am not the typical politician. Politician. I was uh, working at the University of Turin when I received uh, a very strange telephone call saying, are you ready to join my government by Mario Monti? And I said yes, within uh, less, yes, less than a couple of hours. I said yes, because I had and still have much confidence in Mario Monti, and because the situation in Italy in November 2011, when our government started, was almost desperate. And it was not only for Italy, but Italy is not Cyprus, Italy is not even Spain. Italy has much higher weight on European destiny. And so the idea that there could be a financial crisis of our sovereign debt, which is very high, and which is the result of previous policies that were supposedly very generous and uh, inspired by solidarity, instead they created this huge debt so the idea of a financial collapse would have threatened the euro and certainly the same idea of a united Europe, because Italy is one of the founding countries. Uh, and in this situation, with a perspective of a financial crisis, the Italian politics was simply blocked. They could devise no solution out of the crisis. That's why, and not out of generosity, that's why they asked and they declared to be ready to support a technocratic government. That's why. And it was a very strange majority, because the majority was made of two political parties that had spent, let's say, the previous 15, 18 years fighting each other, not thinking of the country, but thinking exactly what to do to, to defeat the other one, to destroy even the other one. So that gives you the idea also 
of a political class that had not devised a strategy for the country in a situation of complete change in the world. Um, so we were asked on the verge of a financial crisis. And the one thing I want to tell you is that there is a huge distance, I was already telling you this the other day, a huge distance between being a university professor and being part of a government that has to make choices for people, for real people. And so I was asked to enact uh, the social security reform, the pension reform. It is true that the reform is severe. It is true. But again, I had less than 20 days. And it is true that we had to act uh, with rapidity also because uh, all the past pension reforms uh, had allowed for very, very long transition so that they had designed a nice pension system but to be applied in 2030. Waiting for uh, reform to be enacted or to be implemented is something that you, it's a luxury. You can enjoy when the economy is doing well. You can't enjoy when you have a financial crisis there. And this is the first thing. The second one, I was told, okay, there is a labor market reform. Mind you that these two reforms were commitment made to the European authorities by the previous government, by the Berlusconi government. They were commitment stated. So I tried to do the labor market reform with social dialogue, this one, was with social dialogue, meaning that I had meetings, endless meetings with trade unions and the Association of Entrepreneurs. And the labor market reform is something where you immediately realize that solidarity is very little among parties having different view, completely different views. So what had a technocratic government to do, trying to reach an equilibrium between opposing views, opposing uh, demands, uh, trying to reach an equilibrium. The equilibrium, again, is for the young, because we know, in Italy this is, because we all talk about solidarity. But when you, are, when you have solidarity for a small group of people in a population and you exclude the others, that means the young women and elderly workers from the inner circle of the labor market which is highly protected, then you can say that solidarity and uh, uh, equality are not in practice. Maybe they are just words. So again, uh, it's difficult to, to enact a reform which goes across generation, across gender, across uh, regions, because certainly we have in Italy a very high divide which has increased in the past 20 years between the north and the south of Italy. And so having to choose in this mess <coughs> is not simple. But uh, only one one thought more. It's true that inequality has increased in Europe, in the US also, and this is not due to the recession, in my view. It is much uh, before the recession. And it is, I think there are many causes, but one is the excessive belief that we put in markets in the past, uh, let's say, two decades. We consider that markets could deliver magnificent results and that if uh, inequality would increase, that was uh, a little price to pay. Now we know also because financial markets are responsible of the crisis that started in the financial sector and then spread over the economy, 
So we now know that the faith that we put in markets was too much. And so we are left without any paradigms. And that is the real problem that in Europe we face today. We need to look for solutions. But certainly solutions are not to come in a time when you have to enact severe reforms because you are strangled by, uh, let's say, uh, um, financial disequilibrium and very high deficits and debt. Sorry. Thank you, Elsa. But you say that I want to meet them. Yeah, yeah. I, I think the offer is clear yeah. and uh, everybody heard it. You are ready to meet them afterwards and to agree on when and where you meet in the afternoon. I think this is uh, a very good initiative and uh, I think uh, our it's friends democracy. will be... It's democracy and our friends will be ready to do so. So not to confuse uh, protecting vested interests with uh, solidarity. I think it's, uh, it's uh, a time to introduce uh, Michael Sandel, who recently wrote a new book, What Money Can't Buy, The Moral Limits of uh, Markets. Uh, Michael is a professor of government at the Harvard University and has taught political philosophy since 1980. Uh, some of you might have followed uh, his courses also on YouTube. And uh, at least from my personal experience, I can say you have uh, quite a substantial uh, fan community here in the country uh, and also younger uh, kids are following your introduction on justice. Uh, today, Michael is with us and we are very pleased that he is here. Uh, and I think he will, uh, in a way, complement or react to what Elsa said by uh, presenting his idea uh, on what the concept of solidarity uh, could help in order to bridge some of the most ardent inequalities that we face. You're welcome, Mike. Thank you. Thank you. In recent... Thank you. I think it's true that in recent decades, the moral and civic basis of solidarity has been eroding. And I think for two reasons, both related to our theme. One of them is the rising inequality in our societies in recent decades. And the other is something that's related but different, and that is the growing tendency of markets and market values and market thinking to reach into spheres of life previously governed by other non-market norms, personal relations, health, education, civic life. Increasingly, every sphere of life is uh, dominated or governed by market thinking and market values. And I think these two tendencies together make solidarity hard to come by. And let me try to explain why. There are at least two different reasons to worry about the rising gap between rich and poor. One reason has to do with fairness to those on the bottom who lack access to income and wealth and opportunities. And that's a familiar reason to worry about inequality. But there's also a second that is subtler but deeply damaging to solidarity. And that is, against a background of rising inequality, the tendency to marketize everything makes, it sharpens the sting of inequality. When, when money only buys material goods or luxury goods or yachts or fancy vacations or BMWs, then then inequality matters, but it doesn't matter all that much. But when money determines access to a decent education, to decent health care, 
to living in a safe neighborhood rather than in a crime-ridden one. When, when it dominates access to political voice and political campaigns, when markets and market thinking govern all of those <coughs> domains, then inequality matters much more. And solidarity becomes more difficult to summon. Democracy doesn't require perfect equality, but it does require that men and women from different social and economic backgrounds, from different walks of life, share enough of a common life to think of themselves as fellow citizens. And what happens when there is rising inequality and when markets govern so much of life is that the affluent and those of modest means increasingly uh, live different ways of life. They don't encounter one another in public places in the ordinary course of life. We, we live and work and shop and play in different places. We send our children to different schools. And this is damaging to democracy because there are fewer and fewer occasions when in the ordinary course of life we bump up against one another. And this matters to solidarity because it creates a condition where not only does inequality hurt those at the bottom, but even those of us who may enjoy access to all of these goods experience a thinner, hollowed out kind of democratic citizenship. So I think this is this is a reason to worry about inequality and the rampant commodification or marketization of social life. I would just mention one other impediment to taking solidarity seriously as a moral and civic project. It's a way of thinking about solidarity and civic virtue that many economists, many mainstream economists, believe, although they never quite prove it. The idea is this. Solidarity, civic virtue, concern for others, fellow feelings, there's only so much of it in the world or in us. And therefore, we should try to conserve it for those moments when we really need it. A great expression of this I came out some years ago, there, there was an, a sociologist, a British sociologist, Richard Titmus, who wrote a book about blood, how to, how to get people to donate blood for those who need it. And he compared the US and the UK. This was the early 70s. And in the UK, there was no buying and selling of blood. It was only donated. In the US, you could donate blood or you could buy and sell it for a price on the market. He showed that adding a market to blood actually led to a less efficient system of blood collection and reduced the supply. Now, from the standpoint of standard economics, this is a paradox, because normally, if you let people establish a market price, you will get more of it rather than less. So, there was a famous economist, Kenneth Errol, distinguished economist, who wrote a critical book review of this account of blood. And he found it puzzling, uh, because he didn't see how adding the choice of buying and selling alongside the ability to give freely could possibly reduce the supply. How could it? Well, what he overlooked, and what many economists overlook, and many of us overlook when we're thinking about social life, is sometimes putting a price on something changes the meaning of that good. And in this case, it changed the meaning of, of donating the good, the good of blood. Arrow said this, like many economists, I don't want to rely too heavily on ethics rather than self-interest. I, I think it's best, on the whole, that the requirement of ethical behavior and solidarity be confined to those circumstances where the price system breaks down 
because we do not wish to use up recklessly the scarce resources of altruistic motivation. <laughs> so the idea is this. The idea is this, that solidarity and civic virtue and the generous virtues are like fossil fuels that are depleted with use. And that's a mistake. It's a mistake. I think the metaphor is misleading. We should not regard solidarity and civic virtue as commodities that are depleted with use. We should instead regard them as muscles that are strengthened with exercise. And so... One of the defects, one of the defects in the market-driven societies that we have come to inhabit is that it lets these generous virtues languish. And so to renew our public life, uh, it seems to me, we need to exercise them more strenuously. Thank you. Thank you, Michael. <laughs> Some... Uh... Analysts think that the unprecedented levels of inequality that we achieved are to a certain extent also the result of the enormous development of uh, financial capitalism since the end of the 70s. Uh, this, of course, can also be disputed, uh, but there is some evidence for it, not only convincing one, uh, and therefore, we thought it's uh, useful to invite somebody who is coming from the heart of uh, uh, the financial markets. Some would say he is the master of inequality. Others would say maybe he is the master of quality. Uh, but anyhow, Andreas Dreichl is the CEO of uh, Erste Bank. And not only that, he is uh, steadily interfering in public debates and making his uh, voice heard. And uh, as you heard already today, the Erste Bank, uh, with its foundation, is contributing also to the dialogue within the society uh, on some of the most ardent issues. So with the view from inside the beast, how would you, <laughs> how would you, how would you address the question of uh, inequality and solidarity. Andreas, please. <laughs> okay, so... Um, let, let me maybe uh, uh, talk a bit about um, the, the, the European context of, of solidarity and, and inequality. Because we, on, on paper, um, Europe looks um, to be the place in which um, solidarity is the highest and inequality is the lowest. Europe looks like being the continent that has the highest amount of solidarity and the lowest amount of inequality. We have 7% of the population of this world. We produce 24% of the GDP of this world. And we have 50% of the social transfer of this world. That looks good. What we don't talk about is the fact that only 1% of the combined European GDP actually goes into Europe. And that 50%, nearly 50% of that 1% goes into agriculture, and it goes into agriculture of the wealthy countries in Europe. So only a very small portion of that, actually, is spent on Europe. Now, a few weeks ago, we told the Cypriots that the guarantee that all politicians in Europe gave on small deposits is not valid for them anymore. Maybe because we were a bit nervous about the anger of some Russian oligarchs. I don't know what the reasons were for that. But we told them. Thirteen years ago, we gave the euro to Europe and southern Europe. 
And with that euro, Southern Europe was able to afford things they could have never afforded without the euro. They bought goods they could have never bought. They built roads, cultural institutions. They bought weapons and whatever they could have never afforded without the euro. What we don't talk about is that over those 13 years, German, French, Austrian, Dutch, Swedish companies made huge profits on those exports to Southern Europe. Banks financed it and made huge profits on those exports to Southern Europe. Northern European governments got huge tax receipts out of those exports to Southern Europe. And now we tell them what you did was wrong. Now we want you to cut your social payments. We want you to cut your wages. We want to cut you to cut your pensions. You Southern Europeans, now you pay for what we sold you. That's solidarity. The debt burden of Southern Europe created millions of jobs in Northern Europe. And it improved our productivity. And now we tell the Southern Europeans to speed up to improve their productivity. Maybe so we can start selling them stuff again instead of helping them that they can sell stuff. Now, okay, we spent 500 billion euros over the last year to help Southern Europe. That's a lot of money. But if you look at the part that, for example, Austria played in it, and we got our fair share in it, our share in that was a fraction, a fraction of what we spend on saving a shaky Corinthian bank. <laughs> now, <clears throat> And this story is not yet over. <laughs> it's not yet over. <laughs> now we, no, we, 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 we truly, we dislike your politicians, and we have a reason for that. We dislike European bankers, and we have a reason for that. The Northern Europeans look down on the Southern Europeans. The Southern Europeans are not very happy with the Northern Europeans. The Western Europeans are feeling threatened by the Eastern Europeans. Now, when I was a kid, and I watched TV, uh, it was black and white then, and I saw Charles de Gaulle, I was proud. When I found out as a kid that Italy not only has spaghetti and a beautiful language, but that they produced fantastic cars and that northern Italy was a fantastic region, I was proud. I was proud when I found out that Germany and France uh, were getting closer. When the Iron Curtain broke down, I was proud. When I saw the first Slovak and Polish cars who passed by me in, in Porsche Cayenne in 1949. It made me happy. What makes me happy about Europe today? Europe has lost its solidarity. You know, if you look at the US, I think probably 50% of the Americans admire Obama. But 100% of the Americans have emotions for Obama. Who has emotions for Barroso or Van Rompuy? <laughs> we have solidarity in Austria. We have solidarity in Germany. We have solidarity in Sweden. I think, besides a few very rich Greeks, there is also some solidarity in Greece. There is no solidarity in Europe anymore. And if we don't get it back, inequality in Europe will grow. Well done. Thank you. <laughs> Very good. Very good. Elsa, you may be surprised to
come to uh, Austria, so to the north, and uh, and meet. I'm going to Norway tonight. Uh, okay, fantastic. Um, well, they even haven't joined the solidarity of the European <laughs> Union because they want to consume the revenues of their oil resources on their yeah, own. Absolutely. So this is a different story. But you're finding and meeting here a, a, a protagonist of uh, the case of the Mediterranean and of the European South as uh, a, an expression of the necessary uh, European solidarity. There have been public expressions in, in Italy, in Greece, uh, in Spain, in Cyprus, uh, that were already indicating that the tensions uh, within Europe, not only economically but also politically, are increasing. How do you view uh, European uh, politics uh, with respect to a necessary joint endeavor to get out of the crisis. Do you think that uh, the Troika and the Germans and others are imposing something on you, upon you that you really do not like and that you wouldn't do without this enormous pressure? Uh, or is there an element of uh, differentiation where you think there are things you should do and others where more solidarity in Europe would be helpful? Uh, first of all, I have to declare openly that I am very much pro-Europe. So I was uh, in Harvard a uh, fortnight ago, and uh, I had debates uh, with uh, young Italian students, their PhD students or young professionals, uh, and I noticed that seen from US, Europe is weak, the euro is too strong and condemning European manufacturing and workers. And so the opinion that uh, euro uh, maybe has not been such a good choice and uh, some country should rethink participating in the euro uh, was uh, strongly supported by, uh, I wouldn't say a minority, but, uh, well, let's say half and half, uh, the opinions were quite divided. And I strongly uh, supported Europe and the Euro. My view is that the Euro is not enough, so we have to build more Europe on what we have already done, not less. <clears throat> I also have the conviction that uh, um, I know that uh, in Greece, in Italy, there are sentiments uh, that uh, I would say uh, cynical politicians are ready to support, and I stress cynical politicians, um, that say, okay, we cannot uh, continue with this euro, the, the euro has... Uh, reduce the, the purchasing power of uh, retired people and has made uh, well, our manufacturing sector, which was a pride of our country, uh, weaker and weaker. Uh, but I'm confident that although the structure of the population is pending towards the elderly, the young are European. They are just European. They could not think of living with the old lira, could not think of going to France and having to show documents. So they are European. And this makes a difference, in my view, between what some leaders say and what the public opinion is with respect to Europe. Uh, a completely different uh, thing is uh, how should uh, Europe move towards having more Europe? And this I mean, uh, for example, uh, a policy to support uh, occupation, um, a policy, a, a macro policy, not just uh, the money and markets, because we have the market, European markets are there, not for 
uh, let's say, for uh, people, not yet at least. Uh, so we have to move in that direction. My view is, uh, considering Italy, is that, okay, we have to show that uh, there is a saying in Germany, we cannot pay for all those Italians enjoying their sun and retiring at uh, uh, 57 and uh, enjoying life and the climate <laughs> and so and Lying under the shadow yeah. of the olive tree, yes. Exactly, <laughs> and while staying uh, up in northern Germany with uh, the rain and yeah. the <laughs> so it's, And so, okay, uh, that's why, again, a technocratic government was asked to make, uh, well, it's not my expression, but the expression that was used in Italy for our, our government was, uh, you have to do the dirty job. That is. And so, meaning, okay, you have to do reforms. And those reforms are there to show any German that will say, okay, Italians are retirely too early. Not any longer, we can say now, not any longer, because we have reformed. <clears throat> the labor market is too rigid. Not any longer, I can say, not any longer. So is okay, we want cohesion in Europe, but we also have to, sh have to show that we are doing seriously, because it's true, again, I have to go back to what I was saying before, we have a large debt. Spain has a large debt. Portugal has a large debt. Greece. We all, uh, we have built our solidarity systems which allowed for a lot of privileges. That is the best thing because solidarity is a good thing, but privileges mm -hmm. are not good. Mm -hmm. And so if you have a, a, a system that are apparently uh, inspired by solidarity, but allow a lot of privileges, then there is no transparency. So reforms are also there to make system transparent and to allow for the true solidarity that the welfare system should endorse mm. and should enact. Mm. That is the problem. Mm. So I really think, I just want to mention one example. In my uh, ministry, I worked a lot with the German Labour Minister, Ursula von der Leyen. Um, uh, we have become friends, I can say, and she was uh, very supportive of policies uh, towards uh, encouraging apprenticeship in our country. Because we know that apprenticeship is good for the young, it's good to give them more stable labor relationship, and it's good for their productivity. It's good to make a closer relationship between employee and employers. And so since they have a lot of experience, good experience, because it's certainly true that apprenticeship has been perhaps the most important factor to reduce youth unemployment in Germany since the early 2000s, then we would like to follow this path. And they have helped us. And it was, uh, we organized a conference in Naples, which is a very difficult city. Naples uh, is exactly the city where you think that apprenticeship is the kind of uh, uh, thing that you want to do. And uh, there were protests, a lot of protests. A newspaper, and she said, no, don't worry, Elsa. Uh, we are used, uh, I am a trained politician, so I am used <laughs> to protest. I'm not, by the way. Anyway, uh, so, and we did this conference. It was not a conference for politicians. It was not a conference for politicians to come and say good works. It was a conference to put together <laughs> firms, German and Italian firms, uh, schools, young people, um, teachers, 
to show how we can uh, uh, fill the gap between school and job. Mm. And this, I think we need thousands of these initiatives. And it showed the good face of German. I said it's the first time that Germany is not asking us to cut some kind of public expenditure. It's coming to help us in a good direction. And so I think this is a kind of solidarity that we need to pursue more and more in Europe. Alfred, could I, could I ask a question? Of course. Yeah. <clears throat> A question of, of the European participants, a, a naive question from an American outsider looking on, <laughs> about the European project. My impression from the outside, and it could be wrong, is that the crisis of the Euro reflects the fact that Europe as an economic project has outrun Europe as a civic and political project. I always thought that the founders of the European Union and the dreamers saw economics, including the Euro, as instruments of a larger political vision and civic vision. And so, if that's right, then my question is, what became of that part of the project? And why did a gap open up between the economic project, which was always originally seen as a tool, as an instrument, to this bigger vision? What became of the rest of the vision, not only in terms of shared political institutions and policies, but also and as I understood the, the original vision, this was the ultimate aim, cultivating over time a shared European identity, a shared civic identity. It, uh, what, what became of that dream and that <coughs> conception, big conception of the European project? Or, or do I have it completely wrong? No, no, that's a good question. Andreas will tell us to whom we did sacrifice the European dream, no? <laughs> I think... <laughs> I think... Uh, I, you're completely, completely correct. Um, I, I think it's even, it's even worse. Um, I believe that the, the Euro actually brought out all the inefficiencies of Europe, the lack of a common Solidarity. The euro actually helped to show us that the, the, the emotion and the solidarity in Europe is not there. We have lost um, the, the pursuit of a political project and we concentrated over the last 13 years on the pure economic project. I, I think it's, it's, it's very simple. It's, and we have that expression in Germany that you, you can't be half pregnant. And this is exactly what we're doing in Europe, and nobody really, and we said we want more Europe. I disagree. Either we go for Europe in total, or we forget it. We have gone that way, either we finish it, and we don't have a lot of time left. Um, if, in my view, during the next 10 years, we don't create, or we don't go very rapidly towards a state, a union, I don't know anything Better. I don't know whether the United States is the best form of a union in the world. I don't know, but I, I don't know a better one. Hmm? Um, I will have no respect for the political Europe as long as I cannot vote for the person that runs Europe. And that means that the Portuguese, the Spaniards, the Swedes, all together, we have to go, we have to become a form of political union. I'm not saying that I love politicians that I vote for, but if I can't even vote for them, uh, it's tilt, over, mm -hmm. over. If we don't go that way, it's done with. Now, that might be a way too, but that to me means that at some point in time, the euro will be gone too, and we're back to square one. Uh, if we want that, that's okay then Europe will be a very nice place 
it's going to take 15, 20 years until the Chinese don't need the German export imports anymore. They will produce their Volkswagens themselves. The last uh, seven, the next seven Volkswagen factories will be built in China. In the last seven years, there has been no car manufacturing plant built in Europe. If we continue like that, we can become an amusement park for rich Chinese and Indians. <laughs> May I just say a word? Just, just, just a second. Uh, of course, there is this uh, caricature of the future of the world where the um, Chinese are the manufacturers and uh, uh, the Americans are again the farmers and uh, <laughs> the Europeans uh, will turn into uh, the Disneyland of uh, the world. Uh, I have to say, even if this uh, sounds compelling, uh, <laughs> I'm not uh, really convinced this, this will be square one. Because what we should not forget is that uh, Europe for centuries was managing social change by war. And what we are in right now is one of the most fundamental yeah. social change that the I world don't. experienced on the technological level, the economic level, and cultural, social level. And my uh, concern is that back to square one would mean, or could mean, that Europe again is adopting the old forms of managing social change, mm. and not the modern way of moderating social change that we developed since 1945. So the alternative to Europe is not the nice village, the peaceful one, mm. where we might be unimportant in the world, but we have our nice life. The alternative to Europe is the practices that have characterized our continent over centuries. Elsa, please. Well, mm -hmm. um, I am an economist, so I hesitate to enter, let's say, a terrain that I do not know, mm -hmm. that is European politics. But I think that the most single factor that uh, prevents going rapidly towards a united Europe is fear, exactly your team. Fear of losing something. Fear, national fears, or even at a smaller level, regional fears. Fears uh, uh, that dominates hope. I remember I was in some Eastern European countries uh, uh, as an expert uh, asked by the World Bank uh, to do consultation on pension reform. And I remember talking to, for example, elderly people. And I clearly remember that they said, but do you think we can ask for something more or do we risk destroying our hope of joining Europe? Mm. So there was hope in their words, and even in their disposition towards accepting sacrifices, because the idea of being within Europe for them was a great hope, was not fear. Now, I think fear dominates the European scene. It's fear of what's happening at the, the whole world. And this is combined with the lack of strategic political views. Mm. That is, we can have uh, good politicians are those who <clears throat> see ahead of most of other people. Mm -hmm. And so they see the design and they indicate uh, perhaps we lack high standard politicians in Europe and maybe we mostly have uh, bureaucrats that are of a different uh, scope. Um, it's a problem. Maybe it's part of uh, the uh, deterioration of our society. 
so we cannot have very good politicians and have, uh, uh, let's say, uh, other categories being just modest. There is uh, a general tendency. So it's difficult, there are many reasons, but it's difficult to just change. And I don't believe that technocrats can be a substitute mm -hmm. for political mm -hmm. visions. Mm -hmm. <laughs> We're not talking now about the quality of politicians. This would, uh, <laughs> would mislead our debate, but... Uh, uh, as you mentioned, <laughs> fear would be a very short debate. Uh, would be a short debate. <laughs> yeah. If we, if we, uh, well, politicians and bankers always compete about quality. So, uh, uh, when fear was mentioned, I, I think Ira, as the one who studied that issue carefully, has to come exactly. in. Exactly. Well, the, listening to this fascinating uh, conversation um, uh, propels the question what kind of moment are we in? Um, and what is the meaning of, of fear and fearfulness? Um, you know, life is full of ordinary risks. We, we take chances all the time. We, we buy a home, we, we take a chance that will go up in value. Once we thought it always goes up in, in value, we learned otherwise. Um, when we marry, um, Almost half of marriages don't end well, but we take a chance. And what is ordinary risk? Um, ordinary risk uh, is a circumstance in which we think we can assess the probabilities of taking a chance. But there are some circumstances where a layering of uncertainty, whether economic uncertainty, social uncertainty, political uncertainty, becomes so great that we find it very difficult to assess the degree of risk. We can't identify the parameters within which we're making choices. And that kind of circumstance induces fear. Fear is a circumstance, a situation, in which a combination of context and motivation occurs in which we find ourselves thinking and acting without guides from the past that persuade us that we know what to do. Um, in the, if we think about uh, thinking of uh, Alfred's remark about um, the past in Europe, um, if we think about the, the interwar period, the 20s and 30s, um, uh, we had circumstances uh, that in part the product of the great slaughter of the first war and then of the, the utter collapse of capitalism, um, uh, the rise of um, dictatorships that claimed to be better democracies because they jumped over all the procedures of messy democratic life of parliaments and parties and polarization and the lack of a, a strong self, uh, sense of public interest. When we, we had the layering of those experiences of violence and economic collapse and of democratic collapse, not just this continent, but the world was charged with fear. And the consequences were deeply ugly, um, uh, devastatingly ugly, uh, that produced a, a, a world in which um, many experiments were conducted, some dreadful, and some, as at least parts of, for example, of the American New Deal, uh, proved to be beneficial. But the degree of uncertainty uh, was great, and the amount of suffering that followed enormous. We are not quite in a moment like that interwar period. Um, we should not exaggerate uh, our circumstances uh, generating fear, but we should be concerned and not take for granted that we simply live in and will continue to live in a world in politics, in social life, in economic life of just ordinary risk. Um, and when we get a layering of sources of fear, we find ourselves in circumstances where ordinary democratic life um, 
comes to be called into question because the democracies are thought to be um, and are seen to be institutions that find it difficult to solve the problems of the day. And when that is called into question, cynicism replaces solidarity and narrow solidarities replace broad mm -hmm. solidarities. And in those circumstances, um, we cannot simply take for granted as givens the decent, normal operation of the decent, normal oscillation of a partisanship and politics in democratic life. One last remark. It's not just in Europe that um, uh, uh, skepticism about democratic politics exists. In public opinion polls in America, people are asked to evaluate our institutions. How well is our parliament, our Congress doing? 11% say, uh, well. Um, uh, one house is Democratic, one house is Republican. It's not a matter of partisanship. It's a matter of a sense that the political system can confront the large problems of the day under democratic procedures. And when that gets called into question, we really have to be fearful. Very important, Ara, the danger of uh, cynicism replacing democratic uh, procedures uh, and um, civil uh, or civic equation uh, of interests. Michael, I ask myself, how do you think solidarity under these circumstances could be promoted and even if we will not find, uh, let's say, an ultimate solution to the problem, how could we at least decrease these tensions, these tendencies of uh, degenerating uh, confidence in democratic institutions uh, and uh, in the institutions that should provide uh, more, more equality? One of the striking features of democratic societies, almost every democratic society I'm aware of today, is the widespread frustration among citizens with the way political parties are working and with the terms of public discourse. I think, I think people sense that economics has crowded out politics, democratic politics, and that the terms of public discourse are impoverished, hollowed out, empty of larger meaning. And I think this is related to the trends we've been discussing in economics. I think it's related to the tendency of market values and market reasoning to dominate public discourse over the past three decades. So at the same time that we've had a rising faith that markets and market mechanisms can define justice and can identify the public good, at the same time, we've seen a rising frustration with the emptiness of public discourse. And I think there's a connection between these two tendencies. The appeal, uh, the allure of of the market faith, of the idea that markets can allocate all good things in life. The appeal of that, I think, is not just or mainly that markets deliver the goods, that they bring economic affluence and prosperity. I think it goes deeper. I think it's that markets seem to spare us the need to engage in public debate about hard, ethical, and even spiritual questions. Because if we're really to have a debate about where markets serve the public good and where they don't belong, where they may crowd out other values, 
we have to have a public debate as democratic citizens about the right way of valuing goods and social practices, whether education or health or national security or the environment or civic life or family life. And those are fraught, deeply contested questions. We hesitate to bring questions of the good life into politics because we realize we live in pluralist societies, people disagree on the meaning of the good life or on how, how to value goods. Mm -hmm. And so we have a tendency to try to keep moral and spiritual questions outside of public discourse, to ask one another to leave our moral and spiritual convictions outside before we enter the public square. And that, I think, leads us to embrace market reasoning as, as if it were a neutral way of deciding these questions. Now, markets are not neutral. They supplant, actually, democratic deliberation about these things. But this is why I think the, the last three decades of market triumphalism and market faith and putting a price tag on everything have contributed to but also expressed the reluctance to engage in recent public debate about big, sometimes controversial, moral and civic questions. And so if, if something like that is right, if that's what's been going on, then to rebuild our civic life and to address the question of where markets belong, we need to find our way to a better, more demanding kind of public discourse from the kind to which we've become accustomed. Not the, beyond the <coughs> narrow uh, managerial technocratic terms of public discourse, which inspire no one. People want, people are hungry for a public life of larger meaning and purpose. They don't just want to check their moral and spiritual convictions at the door when they enter democratic life. And we shouldn't insist that they do, even though, not because we're going to agree. And the, the, the morally more robust kind of civic discourse, I think, would be more clamorous, maybe more contentious, but I think it would also be a healthier kind of public discourse. It would enable us to contend with some of these questions about markets and inequality. And I think it might provide a basis for a better democratic citizenship. May I ask a question to Michael? Yeah, just a second. Uh, I, I think that's a thrilling idea. However. <laughs> no, uh, that brought me to the following uh, idea. The thing is, the 20th century, to a certain extent, has been uh, dominated by authoritarian ideas and regimes, yeah. be it fascist or communist yeah. or whatsoever. Uh, both embarking from the conviction that uh, most of the decisions are taken away from the individual and going to some sort of oppressive state apparatus. Right. Right. And uh, on the other hand, you had the, the market allocation idea that for quite some time was operating within some limits. But the disappearance yeah. of authoritarian regimes seems to have released also the self-set boundaries to our market-driven economies. Mm -hmm. And at the moment when it might have been useful, we didn't say stop because we allowed that the principles of market economy were also translating into the principles of a market society. This is how I understand what you're describing. Yeah. So we are, we experienced the cruel authoritarian uh, oppressive state society 
And now we experience the completely deliberated market society and what seems to constitute the necessity for uh, the conversation and the discourse you ask for is that we need something new where we put in balance again what should be to the market in delivering goods, economy, what should be left to the autonomy of the individual, right. where are limits also of society coming in into my sovereign individual right. decision-making process, and what are the tasks of society and what we are doing together. Right. So we are, in a way, back to the most fundamental questions <coughs> uh, of political philosophy uh, as a result of uh, the fundamentalist experiences uh, of the 20th century. The Elsa. I had a question. I just would like to, uh, let's say, put practice into our discourse, okay. which are really fascinating. But let's take what, in my view, is perhaps the most important problem in Europe now, which is unemployment, and particularly youth unemployment. So we can say, as a matter of principle, that uh, having, well, that working is a right to the individual, because working, well, makes the individual independent, fulfill his, her life, and so and so. So, in principles, we all know the basics, but how can we reach this in practice? If we look at markets, we have very different uh, uh, recipes. We have, for example, the Spanish did a reform that was uh, perhaps the most uh, radical liberalization of the labor market. And the result is uh, precariousness of uh, particularly some segments of the labor market. The young again, women, the elderly, um, which only means, that, which means that uh, the demographic group that result is adult men. They are the, typically the most protected mm. in the labor market. Okay, uh, so I don't think that going towards uh, a um, solution which is uh, complete liberalization is good because it can be, it can relieve uh, unemployment in the very short run, but it doesn't create the premises uh, for a stronger labor market yeah. performance. Uh, on the other hand, if you put uh, some constraints, maybe this is not consistent with the, the phase we are living in, which requires, as Andrea was saying, uh, a reduction in uh, European wages. So this is uh, um, said every day at uh, the European in institutions level. But we don't know a reduction in the wages uh, in some countries. They are already quite low, and I'm taking Italy as an example, as a prominent example. So we have to take other routes, which are perhaps uh, uh, longer and uh, more uncertain, which are trying everything that can enhance the productivity. So how can we go from principles that are very important and that we all share to putting them in practice in a decent way that we as society can accept? for all Europe and for all the world. Yeah. How can we go from principle to practice? Mm. Mm. The practice will be answered by Andreas, but uh, <laughs> Ira will come in for a second. I, I, I just want to observe that in the United States, um, we've had a, um, a long running history of a part of a young population 
almost without hope of work, of wage labor work. That is, in, at the very beginning, Alfred, you observed that in the United States we seem um, deeply concerned with the uh, circumstances of inequality and lack of solidarity in our cities. And that is in parts of our cities, we have young people um, with unemployment rates over long periods of time, not just since the Great Recession, um, that are higher than the Spanish uh, levels, uh, even in 30 and 40 percent. Today, in a central city, deeply poor, uh, primarily racially minority neighborhoods, uh, people between 16 and 24 have 50 percent um, unemployment okay. rates. And in tandem with that long-term circumstance, we have um, the highest uh, incarceration rates um, in the world. Um, so there is a kind embedded in the social reality of the West is an example of a, of a kind of nightmare that occurs when opportunities for work are absent for generations, young people, over a long period of time. Um, but this um, uh, leads me to a reflection back to um, the issue of uh, the content of uh, politics and the role of ethical and moral um, discourse. Um, I, I'm completely in agreement with Michael about um, the dangers of having market talk and market practices overwhelm all spheres, um, including the political. Uh, but I think it's, uh, we need at least one more step before being confident about the entry of uh, ethical uh, and moral and cultural divisions into the heart of political life. And that intermediary piece has to do with the character um, and belief in our institutions as decent mediators within which uh, deep ethical differences can be adjudicated. Because absent institutional confidence and institutional effectiveness and institutional decency, um, the entry into deep ethical differences can, under the worst circumstances, and especially under circumstances of deepening inequality, produce many small solidarities which come to be at war with each other, and some of which can attach themselves to anti-democratic uh, impulses, to the denial of rights of others, and when there are situational democratic majorities, to the imposition of one group's ethical preferences over another's. Um, I, I'm, I know you fully uh, would be in accord with uh, the importance of institutions. You've written eloquently about it. Um, but I think we shouldn't um, think about the health of democratic politics um, simply in terms of the character of our discourse, but connect the character of our discourse to the depth and ability of our institutions, and in turn, to think about the pressures put on those institutions by persistent and deepening kinds of inequality, economic, cultural, physical, and social. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Andreas, I will address you now, um, if I may, as an enlightened economic actor that uh, who is able to look beyond uh, his self-interest or the interest of uh, his institution. When Elsa mentioned about what is the talk of the European institutions to put down wages in Europe uh, in order to reach, uh, again, uh, competitiveness, uh, in your view, is reducing wages by whatever means the only possibility uh, to rescue some sort of European recovery, the only way to come back to growth, 
Or uh, should we not also think about what possibilities of sharing we have in Europe, not only in between nations and countries, but also within uh, the population we have, uh, in order to come to a more equitable <clears throat> distribution of income and wealth that might help us uh, to create the sort of demand we desperately need for the recovery of our economy. Well, I, I think it's, it, it's a very, it's, clearly it's a very, very serious situation. I mean, cutting wages um, is not a solution. Um, cutting wages takes away growth potential. Um, cutting wages is just one of many austerity measures and we all know that austerity does not create growth. Uh, now, I, I think that it, it's a very, very difficult um, uh, microeconomic situation that we're in. Um, and what is true for, for companies is true for, for governments. Um, you cannot grow a company by cutting costs all the time. Um, you have to increase revenues. If you, all you do is cutting costs and kicking out employees, one point in time you're dead. Um, and it is the balance of the two that is so hugely important and that is so hugely difficult um, at the moment, in, in particularly in southern Europe. Um, but it's becoming also increasingly difficult in, in Western Europe. You know. I, I, I know, it, you know it, it's not extremely enjoyable to be a banker for the moment, but to be an Italian politician for the moment <laughs> is horrible. Hmm? It's nightmare. That must be, I really don't envy you. For, because it's clear, it, it's a huge, hugely difficult um, task to manage rightly between growth and saving. How, how, how do you do that? Now, we all know that Europe as a whole is less indebted than the United States. Um, uh, we all know that you know, the United States, um, to clean up uh, the financial crisis, have let more than 300 banks um, taken out of the market. In Europe, with the exception of Spain, and including Italy, we have not taken any banks out of the market. We're still feeding banks. We're not cleaning up the financial sector. We're not helping um, um, to, to, to set the economic balance right in Europe. So I, I really think it's, um, um, it, it, it's, we're endangering with misled economic policy in Europe, we're endangering the democratic values of Europe for the moment. I think it's a hugely dangerous situation because what we see for the moment is that with the exception of the United States that has started to re-industrialize the country, not only cleaning up the financial system. Now, we have now Austrian companies investing in the United States because the conditions are better there. If we look aside from the United States, which are the countries that are prosperous for the moment, that are growing? Are those democratic countries? Is Russia a democratic country? Is China a democratic country? Uh, so the United Arab Emirates, do you know how much these United Arab Emirates invest in education? You know how much they invest in culture? You know how much they invest in social welfare? And what do we do in Europe for the moment? In addition, I think it's all a matter of timing. We have a country in Europe that has shown very well how important timing is. It's Sweden. They have had enormous tax burdens, enormous tax burdens. Companies paid 70% tax plus. Income tax was 80% plus in a prosperous period of time when Sweden was growing. And now when the economy went down, they're cutting down taxes in order to help the economy grow again. And they're successful with it. And what do we do in France? What are we attempting now in most of the European countries? We do exactly the opposite. I, you know, 
I, I, I really think that the lack of a coordinated, sinful economic policy in Europe, on a European level, and we don't have it, is endangering the democratic principles of Europe. And I'm scared about it. So if the standards tomorrow is uh, maybe writing about today's event, Please not. he gave some uh, justification for writing Andreas Streichel, dash, take away the money from the banks. Uh, and put them into jobs and culture and social expenses. Uh, <laughs> this, this was a voluntary service to the standard, of course. <laughs> <laughs> Michael, please. To respond to a, a strands in the discussion, I agree with Ira that institutions are important. The problem is democratic institutions aren't working very well in most democracies and political parties are not working very well. And my hunch is that we won't be able to revitalize democratic institutions without changing the terms of public discourse. And to do that, we need to rely on, um, I think, not only institutions, but also on civil society and on social movements where we can begin to reimagine the terms of civic life, and then, maybe, with any uh, luck and hope, political parties or established institutions can be forced to respond or to, to be revitalized and transformed. I, I accept and I understand the worry that a morally more robust public discourse might open the way to intolerant voices, to majoritarianism, to some, trying, to some trying to impose their values on others. And this is a familiar argument for trying to keep public discourse um, from engaging with conceptions of the good life. But I think it's a mistake for the following reason. When we see, we think first when we think of bringing ethical argument into politics. We think about the, the image of the Taliban comes to mind or of Christian fundamentalists or the darker strands of anti-immigrant populist parties. And they know how to mobilize moral passions and spiritual ideals. They do. And that's why the rest of us shrink from it. But I think we shouldn't shrink so quickly. I think we should begin by noticing that what empowers those groups and makes our public life vulnerable to them is precisely the emptiness of mainstream public discourse with regard to values. Because a, a, a technocratic managerial kind of public discourse may seem to be a kind of safe, neutral space, keeping all of these convictions at a distance. But no dem democracy can abide that moral vacuum at the heart of its public life for long. And so that opens the way for narrow, intolerant voices and gives them greater strength and prominence than they would have if there were a more varied, more pluralistic, ongoing argument about questions of the good life and how they bear on, on politics and democracy. I don't have an answer. Elsa knows better than I how to design programs to deal with the staggering levels of youth unemployment. I would just make one observation. If we're to aim at energizing public discourse to grapple with those hard questions. We have to find a way, I think, to address them, not only in terms of the technical economic questions that you know about it, but it, m most of us citizens don't. Take the most pressing issues facing the welfare state that, that we've been discussing youth unemployment, 
at one end of the generational spectrum, pensions, retirement, health care at the other. So we've got youth unemployment and education. We've got pensions and health care. Underlying the choices we make about how to deal with those challenges and what resources are certain questions about the terms of relation among generations. And we've talked about solidarity across classes and across parts of Europe, but there's also the question of the solidarity uh, across generations. And that, I think, is at the heart of some of the toughest questions that welfare states face to get exactly. today. And exactly. if that's the case, then what we really need to discuss is a new social contract among generations, which brings in questions about the life cycle and about the kinds of help and support needed at different uh, points along the life cycle. It brings questions of family life and how to understand the terms of relations among generations, which is to say it brings economics and policy questions directly into contact with competing ideas, we won't all agree, on what a good life looks like in its generational trajectory. And so having that as a, making that aspect of these choices explicit would be one example of what I mean by um, being less squeamish and less reluctant about engaging directly with questions of the good life, even as we grapple with these very concrete policy questions of youth unemployment, education, pensions, Pension. health care, and how to accommodate their competing claims. Thank you. Ira, please. In, in um, listening to Michael's um, very appealing and uh, eloquent thoughts, um, I, I was thinking about what kind of solidarity we need now, within which that kind of discourse could take place. And in a democratic world, we need solidarity about the following values. Uh, the importance of the rule of law, the importance of government by consent, the sense that uh, both individual and where appropriate group rights are truly respected, where toleration um, is a value, and where the system of political representation is looked to as the site to adjudicate our differences um, about deep values. Absent that kind of solidarity, that's a solidarity about preferences, about political values. What, what should animate the context within which we can decently debate our differences? Differences both about how to cure economic problems, differences about the role of government, differences about the good life. What concerns me most today is that the combination of longer term trends that were generating inequality before the crash, combined with the deepening of crisis caused by the Great Recession, deepened by political policy decisions, some of which were inescapable, um, that in, at least in the short term, widen divisions in society, that under those circumstances, these core political values, without which we should be fearful, um, erode. And I think we have not decades, but short years to demonstrate the capacity of our European, North American, and other democratic systems, Latin America, Asia, elsewhere, to show that they can grapple with the deepening of inequality in ways that promise a pathway toward more decent and common outcomes. And absent that, these central values of rule of law, consent, representation, 
tolerance and a faith in representative government might well uh, continue to erode. And then none of the conversations we would like to have could be conducted in a decent way. Uh, that, I think, is the, is the worry of our time. I think it's that, John. Mm -hmm. okay. Well, I think that was uh, a very important uh, framing of what uh, uh, we are facing at the moment. Uh, I think it became clear that there has to be a certain understanding of what keeps our societies together. Ira just elaborated uh, what should be the, let's say, minimal consensus for the rules of the game in order to address some of the ardent moral and ethical questions, and of course among them also the question of inequality. It seems that the major danger for democratic policies is a vacuum in the public debate. Uh, it seems that the hypothesis of there is no alternative, which dominated the public discourse for quite some time, is a major danger for democracy because if you're not ready anymore to think in alternatives and different choices, uh, accepting different uh, experiments all around the world that uh, you would bring to the table and uh, take the best out of it, uh, then we are at the end of the democratic discourse. And therefore I think it was extremely important that uh, with the help of uh, our friends from the United States, Ira and Michael, uh, Andreas and Elsa were uh, able to put our European challenge uh, within that framework and to elaborate on uh, some of the perspectives and necessities that we face. And it was my pleasure uh, to be with you today in the morning. Uh, I hope, uh, ladies and gentlemen, you enjoyed too. Uh, and you know what is the most important thing in Vienna? One o'clock lunchtime. <laughs> Don't miss it. All the best. <laughs>